Um, so I'm, I'm Paul Wouters. Uh, feel free to ask any questions. Like, just raise your hand, interrupt me. Um, and if it's if, if the question's too big, I'll like we'll take it offline somewhere else. Um, so I work for uh, the Librasound project. That's where my mo my main focus is on. Um, and uh, and Red Hat lets me lets me do a lot of work on that. So it's really nice. Uh, most people know us from being the enterprise IPsec solution. Um, it works really well, um, but we also have this other leg of our project, which really has this aim to encrypt the entire internet. And we're not there yet, but um, you know we're hoping to to add more and more. But um, as I'll show you in some of the history, that's been a really long, slow project. Um, so um, yeah, we, we've done recently a lot of certification stuff to uh, to get our code into good shape. And we, um, we actively are at the IETF uh, proposing new standards and extensions to Ike. Uh, not so much for IPsec, because that's sort of, it's defined and it works. But for Ike, we do have a, a bunch of things that, uh, that keep getting proposed and, and added to the standard. So we're pretty active there as well. So for those of you not very familiar with IPsec, um, this is the one slide explanation of IPsec. Um, it consists of two parts. Ike, That is interesting. <laughs> it scrolls fine here. You're using the VGA converter to crash periodically. So what do I do then? Unplug? Are you, are you VGA or HDMI? If you're HDMI, it's your laptop's fault. You need VGA. Then it's the laptop's fault. Yeah. <laughs> really? Okay. Um, interesting. I can't even read that. <laughs> Is that full screen? No, too high. Okay. Yay. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so now I won't be able to read the slides, so I'll be walking around a bit more. <laughs> um, Sorry? Do you want a slide turn so you can stand Oh, uh, sure. If that doesn't crash my laptop for. It's worked with my Lemon's laptop for a while. you go back one slide? Anyway, just plug it in and support the back of the screen. It's been having range problems because I think it's these slides are blocking the signal. Are there viruses on that? Yeah. I've got lots of Windows viruses on it. Okay, awesome, thank you. So I'll try to not block the screen. Okay, so <laughs> we'll try that. So IPsec basically consists of two parts, and it's a little bit confusing because people tend to call it IPsec, but IPsec is really the data channel. That's the, um, where all the packets are encrypted and decrypted. It's the kernel that's usually doing that. And then we've got Ike, which is the command channel. So that's your userland application that sends the negotiation packets to authenticate the other peer and then set up an, what they call Ike association. And um, uh, after authentication, they agree on some key material and then they uh, send that key material to the kernel that will then do the encryption. And there's some parameter negotiation as well, uh, which, which IP addresses are allowed. Um, IPsec is not a virtual ethernet where you can just throw anything at it. You're supposed to really you know, clamp down on the policies of source destination address, ports, protocol. Um, even though a lot of VPN people don't do it and they just build a tunnel from 00 to 00, that's not really how we like to see things done. Um, what else? So Ike itself is encrypted. Uh, don't mistake that for the encryption of the packets. Those are two separate, uh, separate things. Uh, and some weird things is that we have two modes, tunnel mode and transport mode. Transport mode was supposed to be the simple one where you have a source IP and a destination IP and you yourself are the source IP. So you can use that for the, for the encryption and protect the packet itself so you don't have to like encapsulate the packet. But because we invented NAT, we sort of destroyed that usability in a, in a reasonable way. So tunnel mode is the much more preferred option these days uh, to use. And uh, because there's also many firewall administrators that tend to block anything not TCP and UDP because they don't really know what the other things are, they uh, sometimes tend to block the ESP uh, protocol, which is protocol 50. 
And so there's also a mode, uh, also for when you're behind NAT, is to encapsulate it into a UDP packet. So it's literally just uh, putting it in a UDP packet, uh, prepend it with four zeros to mark it and send it out. Um, so that's ESP and UDP. So let's see, do I have range? I have range. So this is your typical VPN. Uh, two insecure networks, very red. Um, they're not encrypted at all. They all talk plain text in the cloud or, or, or in the data center. And except when you go across the internet, do people go like, okay, we should encrypt this. Let's you know, put some gateways in there. And, uh, and they, they do the encryption there. And those are usually your choke points. Uh, single point of failure, maybe you know, dual point of failure if you got like a hardware failover set. Um, and usually these machines also um, are fairly expensive if you're doing like high bandwidth stuff. Uh, the licensing costs go, go up. Um, so it's the traditional way of doing it and we can do much better. This is the other traditional setup. It's where you've sort of got the remote working setup, you, you're roaming, you connect to the corporate VPN server, and then you again get access to the network, but that network Excel it itself, again, is completely in the clear, unprotected, and so half of your connection is still sort of in the clear. Luckily, we all use SSH and HTTPS, so it's somewhat mitigated, but we still leak a lot of clear text packets. So to give you a bit of history, um, this goes all the way back to 1996 when John Gilmore started the project and was like, you know what, we should encrypt the internet. <laughs> Let's start with, in 1996, to get 5% of the internet traffic uh, protected against passive wiretapping. Um, so we kind of failed on that. Um, but uh, it, was, it was a really good start. Um, the idea was opportunistic encryption. John Gilmore didn't really give care much about the enterprise VPN. He was like, well, those people have money. They can come up with their own thing. What I really want is to encrypt the entire internet. Uh, and that means encrypting between two parties who've never heard of each other before and who not necessarily trust each other, but they just want the communication to be encrypted. Um, so some people sometimes ask me what the SWAN stands for. There's a, there's a few forks we'll see in a bit. Um, SWAN stands for Secure Wide Area Network. Um, it was trademarked by RSA, so people stopped using it, even though the FreeSwan project had some, um, some permission to use it. And so instead, the term VPN became really the, the common term that everybody uh, started using. Um, it predates OpenSSL, um, which means there was no crypto library that you know, the project could use. It all had to be written from scratch. Um, there were no protocols yet, so the RFCs hadn't been written yet for IG or IPsec, so they were part of the of the, of the efforts of making, this, uh, making the, the, uh, the IPsec and IAC protocols happen. So they, were, they joined the IETF from the start and tried to make this happen. Um, it took a really long time. Uh, one famous quote from Gilmore is that um, the, the NSA um, tried to um, slow down the project and add too many features. And I think, I think the quote is a little bit um, out of context because um, we were really our own worst enemy, you know, designed by committee kind of things, delivered these kind of solutions. And um, I don't think that NSA actually deserves credit for that. Uh, I think we, we really all did it ourselves. Um, it predates the crypto API for people who are old enough to remember kernel.i.org and export laws and all these things. So all these problems were added to the, to the project. And, you know, we want to encrypt, but you know, where do we publish the source code? We can't publish it in the US because then it's export restriction, so it has to be done elsewhere. And, and Americans cannot touch the code because you know, at the time, President Clinton could, uh, could, could order via a, a national security letter that you know, uh, if Americans touch it, it's Americans and nobody else can use it. So uh, what happened was that most of the development actually happened in Canada. Um, because no Americans were, you know, John Gilmore did not let, uh, let Americans touch code, which also caused a problem because at the time the network uh, maintainer was Dave Miller, and so there was quite a bit of friction, like he didn't want to pull it into the kernel if he couldn't maintain and maintain it and change it and, and patch it. So, so there was this weird standoff that caused basically the kernel part of IPsec to live outside of the main kernel like up until like the early 269 uh, days. And so all this time there was this separate kernel module called CLIPS, which uh, Richard there um, maintained a bunch of it. And when he left, I was uh, <laughs> forced to take over some of this, uh, this gluing. 
Um, and the, the history with the upstream kernel was that uh, I was actually at the uh, 2002 kernel summit, and about the only thing I contributed to that was the date that was the drop dead date for the kernel features going into 2.6. So it was 2.5 at the time, and they were looking for a freeze date, and they were haggling over August versus Christmas, and I just jokingly suggested Halloween, and it stuck. Okay. So then a couple of days before Halloween, that's when Dave Miller checked right. in a pile of OptiSign stuff into the right. main long term. And, and one, of my, one of my first times that I actually met some of these kernel developers and Alan Cox and Dave Miller was when the Freeshawn people and the networking people got into a room together and said, okay, how are we going to hook this together? And in the end, it was decided to use the routing because there was nothing better than route it into an, uh, some device that gets tied to a kernel module that can then do the processing. The most interesting part for me at that meeting was I was a pretty new person to it, so I, I didn't have many, uh, not much experience at all was that in a room full of kernel experts, only Alan Cox was able to go to the whiteboard and say, this is how the packet flow works in the kernel. You, you know, it goes through this part and then this part and this part. And I was like, it was already really complicated. And we're talking about 2.0 kernels. So like these days, it's, it's, you know, it's orders of magnitude more complicated. Um, there was also no DNSSEC uh, and, and, and not much of a CA industry at the time yet. So the, one of the big problems was key distribution. Like how do you distribute your keys to basically strangers to validate those keys? If you're talking to someone with no uh, pre-configuration, how can you trust them that they are who they are? And so the solution was sort of embedded in, well, we'll do it in DNS and make sure that DNS gets secured, and then later on we can build on that. Um, Unfortunately, that took a, took a really long time. So what happened? Well, like they really, they really, uh, it really worked really well. Like uh, enterprise uh, setups uh, with IPsec worked really well. Um, during uh, interop test, like FreeSwan was the gold standard. If you interoperated with FreeSwan, you had a properly working Icon IPsec stack. Like it was really the cornerstone of, of IPsec. Um, so that was good. Um, things that didn't work out as well, um, it took a really long time. So the, the development within the IETF went really slow. Um, you know, United States citizens couldn't, couldn't touch the code, so there were less people that could actually do things. Um, the other big thing was because everything was packet triggered, it meant that when the kernel would send a message to the user and saying, I've got an IP packet from this source to that destination, and you want a tunnel, but I don't know anything else, and the, the Ike demon had to go figure out, okay, this is the source destination. Who is this? Who's talking to who? Where do I find the authentication of this person? Where's the identity? And so the only way that, the only method that was available at the time was the reverse DNS. So uh, we said, okay, well, we'll put the key, the IPsec key in the reverse DNS. And then by the time, you know, later on when that gets secured with DNSSEC, then we will have a really good distributed authentication mechanism. Um, the problem was that um, basically the reverse got abandoned. Like for IPv4, you could really only get to it when you were in the data center. You couldn't really, if you're an end user at home on your, your, your DSL or your dial-up line at the time, you just had no chance of getting access to your reverse. So from a practical purpose, that just never worked. The other thing that was problematic was NAT support. Like when, when NAT really started to become so common, you didn't even have an IP address that you could attach to yourself. So you would have this asymmetric thing where you could connect to a server and you would know its IP address and maybe you could from its reverse get the identity and then look it up. And then you yourself could then tell the server, well, I'm really this entity, you can look it up in a forward DNS. So that could work, but then if you had two entities on dynamic IP addresses, it wouldn't work, or, or, or if you wanted to connect to your neighbor, it wouldn't work. So it was, it was fairly limited. Um, and, you know, and that's the other problem. Like, to make this work, you had to have an identity. So your laptop or your phone would have to have an identity that is published somewhere, somehow. And that really didn't work very well. And the reason that, that SSL actually took off as it did <laughs> was that it didn't require the client to authenticate itself. It could just authenticate to the server. The server didn't really care who talked to it as long as it was encrypted and you know, the client was fine with, with, with whomever. Um, the, the, the unauthenticated encryption, so let's just do Diffie-Hellman, do a session key and not bother authenticating, was rejected by the project at the time. It said, oh, this is just too insecure, let's not do that. You know, it's really easy for a passive attacker to become an active attacker, and it offers no real protection. 
Now, had they known that everything would take 15 years, they probably would have said, okay, let's start with this and then we'll bump it up as, as we go. But they didn't, so you know, it was another 15 years of, of you know, massive monitoring and storing of data that people could do. Uh, DNSSEC, like, it, it was really slow. Like uh, 2010, the route finally got signed. Now we're finally seeing enough support on end nodes that they can actually use it and validate and not have you know, DNS packets drop or Cisco firewalls drop uh, uh, DNS fragments and other things. So it's finally now becoming, becoming uh, useful. But then the other main point was, this, these are all technical points. The other main point was that even when in 2001 the Echelon network was outed and you know, published to the world at large by Duncan Campbell, people didn't really care. Like, pff, you know, they're not spying on me, you know, why do I care? Like, this is also sort of before everybody's life was attached to their mobile phone where all their data and email and everything came in. So they didn't really care. Like, oh, I don't have that much to hide. So meanwhile, um, so, so John Gilmore gave up. He's like, I've funded this for, I don't know how many years, uh, seven years. He was like, I'm done with this. You know, the only people really using it are the enterprise VPNs and they can fund it themselves. Like, I'm not doing this. So I met up with John Gilmore at the CCC in 2003 in Germany. And we sat down and was like, okay, how can we do this? So we, uh, let's, let's, let's fork this nicely because, uh, you know, we're still good friends. Um, but he just wanted to pull out. So what happened was that uh, we agreed to fork. We used OpenSwan as a working name. I couldn't come up with anything better, so it stuck. And uh, John did some, uh, he talked to Schneier and Niels Ferguson. Uh, they decided, let's do a paper that says all the bad things of IPsec. We'll strip it out of FreeSwan uh, as a demo to see that you can do this. And then we'll just never do a FreeSwan release again. So that's what happened. Uh, Freeze one, 205, 206 are releases that removed transport mode, AH, um, uh, NAT support, and I think there was some X509 support that got yanked out. So they were like, these are all evil things, so we yanked them out. And so, of course, nobody used it, but John made his point. Meanwhile, um, a company was founded, plus uh, the OpenSound project was founded, two separate entities that uh, one was supporting the other moving forward. Um, Red Hat actually got a bit involved and hired, uh, hired the company to, uh, to do some things. Uh, they, they supplied the native IPsec patches. So meanwhile, the XFRM uh, netkey stack got added to the kernel um, in about 269. It took a few iterations before it was usable, and it actually took a long time. I would say probably until like late in the 26, early 3 series that it's really, it's really got all the features that we wanted. And, and I'll, I'll list them later on. Um, but for OpenSwan, it was like, like you know, it, it was folded into RHEL 6. It became like even more of a standard enterprise solution. Um, there was some hardware acceleration support added to OpenSwan, um, not used in RHEL. Uh, it's OCF based. That was the open cryptographic framework from, uh, from OpenBSD. Uh, that was the DEF crypto device. Um, at the time, it was really important to have the hardware drivers accessible in user land because it was still cheaper to copy the whole thing from user land to the kernel, have the kernel do it with the driver and then push it back. It was still faster than for user land to do it without acceleration. Meanwhile, we've reached a point where that's no longer true. User land has access to direct AES instructions. So all of these things are, 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 are no, no longer true. So it's been since also been removed. Um, Ike v2. The successor to the, the first Ike uh, protocol, um, there were some things that people really didn't like. For instance, the, the, the worst thing was that if you did pre-shared key authentication, the only way you knew that the other side and you didn't agree on a pre-shared key is if you got garbled stuff and you couldn't decrypt it. So the error messaging was horrible. Like, I cannot decrypt your packet. Maybe your pre-shared key is wrong? I don't know. Um, so there are a few extra things. Also, Ike v1, both sides were responsible for retransmitting which gets you into this really uh, denial of service thing where amplification attack where you send one spoof packet to an Ike v1 uh, gateway and it will start sending like 10, 20 packets depending on the exponential backoff that they've implemented. Um, uh, Akamai actually did a paper on that uh, a couple of months ago. Um, so um, that was not good, but people realized it. So in Ike v2, it's the sender's responsibility. So only the sender retransmits uh, if it doesn't receive an answer and the, the responder never retransmits. Um, unfortunately, we had no funding at the time for opportunistic encryption. Uh, like I said, no one really cared. There was nobody behind it. So, so it sort of fell off. 
uh, and didn't get used very much. And then in 2011, 2012, there was you know, the, 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 the company that was related to this but didn't own the project sort of fell apart and there was a discussion on, on who owned the name or not. There was a lawsuit and at some point we decided it's just better to rename our project than to spend more money on lawyers. So that's how we got to LibreSwan. It's really a continuation of OpenSwan. It's got the exact same people behind it. Um, and so uh, LibreSwan like, uh, got into RHEL 7. Um, it meanwhile got into RHEL 6 because at some point backporting things was just too hard, especially with the the new FIPS code, and you know there were just too many changes. We couldn't backport it anymore. It was like five years of code was being backported. It was just unsustainable. So I finally managed to convince people inside Red Hat to you know get rid of OpenSwan and put uh, put LibreSwan in. So lots of updates. Um, where in OpenSwan you could optionally use NSS or the old 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 pre OpenSSL crypto code. All of that legacy was removed. NSS was made mandatory. Uh, we removed all the X509 code, ASN1 parcels. Everything was outsourced to NSS. Um, crypto suites update, so we removed things like Blowfish and other things. And uh, well, single desk was never supported. Um, some older mod P groups. We also we were always pretty um, progressive compared to other people, so we never supported mod P768. We did support mod P1024 uh, and 1536, um, and now we're we're actively pushing those out as well. So for Ike v2, we start with mod p2048 and accept higher. And um, I'm actually part of, uh, within the IETF of the, uh, both the documents for Ike and IPsec, the mandatory to implement crypto algorithms. And we're pushing it even further out to make sure that all this, these old algorithms are going away and we're, we're focusing on the new ones. There's a question or? Are you looking at any post-quantum stuff as well? Sorry? Yes, um, the ITF, yeah, the ITF uh, working group has looked at it, and there's a proposal uh, to basically what the ITF wants to do now is they want to put a stopgap in for post quantum computers. So if they now start collecting all the data, and 10 years from now they have a quantum computer, we want them not to be able to decrypt the last 10 years of traffic. So this allows us to sort of defend without knowing what a quantum computer exactly will look like. So. The idea that's been floating around now is that um, we'll use a post-quantum pre-shared key, which kind of sucks because the whole idea of Ike was to not have pre-shared keys uh, done. But so for now, we'll, people who want it can uh, do an additional pre-shared key. Um, you can send an identifier in the first packet so you can list where you want it, or you can, it could be like a, whatever, an entanglement device with a light beam, or it can be a one-time pad, or you know, whatever construct you like. You send the identifier and the other party knows what the identifier is and the man in the middle doesn't. Um, then we do a regular, what's likely, this is all draft material, right? So it's not guaranteed yet. Um, the idea is that if you care about the Ike essay, which is just a command channel, which Normally you don't, right? Because 10 years from now, who cares what the command channel is encrypted to? You cannot do anything with it unless you can decrypt the keys. So you really only want to protect the IPsec keys and you don't care so much about the I keys. So with that protection in, there is still a mode where people say, well, we also want to know, because you can have address assignments happen inside Ike and maybe that will reveal who it was because he always gets the same address. So for that, the idea right now being floated is we do an immediate rekey with the post quantum key mangled into the, the key material stream. So to, to throw into the KDF. So then at least in the first uh, Ike exchange, they would be able to decode 10 years later, but then the, the next one that immediately comes out uh, should be fine. And then of course, there's also the post quantum protection for the IPsec SA keys. So, so that's the sort of stop gap people are now thinking. And it's also independent of any of the designs of hardware and things that they're now doing. Um, okay. So, so we got to the point again where we sort of could look at like, so, so you know, 10 years have passed or seven years have passed. Let's, let's look again if we can do opportunistic encryption. Um, Ike v2, one of the features as well is that it allowed asymmetric authentication. So like TLS, we could say, you know, the client can identify differently from the server. It didn't, it didn't support null authentication yet, um, but we added support for that. Um, I'll show it in a sec. Um, Ike v1 also didn't really natively allow a, a nice uh, address assignment, and in v2 that was more internalized, it was more fundamental to the protocol. So we can now, we know that everybody has this support. Same for like on Ike v1, they bolted that peer detection on later, 
And so you didn't know if the other end would support that peer detection. But with IKE v2, it's part of the core spec, so you know everybody supports it. And the same for net traversal support. Like you couldn't guarantee that it worked for any client, but now in IKE v2 you can. So we've got all these features that are now ready for us to actually much better see what the other guy is, what the other endpoint is capable of, and actually uh, use this. And because we will need some of those features. Um, Linux XFRM was vastly improved between the early 2.6 and now. Um, I'll, I'll go on a little on the sidetrack, actually. When people talked about earlier about um, bugs that live for seven years, I will give you a, a bug that is still living. Um, the early draft for SHA-2 in encryption was to use, uh, for SHA-256, the truncation was set to 96 bits in the draft. When the RFC was finalized, it became 128, like half the key size. In XFRM, there's the struct XFRM auth, which you can only specify a key size, not a truncation size. So um, whoever, I don't know who decided this, um, they decided to leave the old draft truncation in and come up with a new struct called um, XFRM auth trunk, where you could specify the key size. So they basically what they did is they left the default the wrong non-RFC value. And so some software that was actively maintained, like LibreSwan and, and StrongSwan, they started using this new method and they had no problems. But it turns out that, for instance, uh, if you look at IPsec tools, Raccoon didn't get updated to that. So now we have, what was it that they said earlier, 1.4 billion devices that cannot properly do SHA-2 uh, authentication with IPsec. Um, I tried to convince people earlier to just get rid of the 96 one, or at least allow the 96 one only through the new mechanism with the truncation set. But they decided, I guess, that to be compatible with what's already out there to keep it. And I think it, like, this really shows that was the wrong decision. Now we have 1.4 billion devices that do the wrong thing. And we didn't have that like you know, seven years ago when this was first uh, came up. So, so if you ever run into a similar situation where there's an old thing and a new thing, try to do the new thing per default and let people deal with how to do the compatibility mode. Like, try always to move to the new thing and drop the old thing. Um, the other thing that came, because DNSSEC has now started to move to the end node, because you can only use secure DNS if the last mile is also protected. So you have to basically run it on your phone or on your laptop to get the full protection. So that actually allowed us to sort of see the DNS lookup and see the name and what it resolved to. And so earlier when I said we only had packet triggers, we only had source destination address, but now if we hook into the locally running DNS server, we actually have a name and a source uh, and a destination address. So then we can go look up for the key in the DNS or you know, uh, the, uh, whatever, LDAP or active domain or you know, the blockchain, wherever you think you can find a way of securely pulling keys, you can pull your keys. Um, and that, that, is, that is an advantage that we're, we're going to use as well. Um, and Linux contract actually got a lot of new features. So you can actually now match with IP tables. You can match based on if there's an IPsec policy. You can say this packet can go through only if it would get encrypted. Or, you know, this packet can only come in uh, on port 25 if it had been encrypted. <laughs> so you, you get a lot of extra uh, flexibility in, in, in there as well. Um, so the only thing that we, we looked at, it's like, okay, we're ready. We can do this now. We can do opportunist encryption. But there was still the one big problem that people didn't really care. So that's until this slide uh, came along. Um, for those who recognize it, the Edward Snowden slide on, on the NSA, where they said, well, this is, where, this is all where the plain text lives that we can sniff. And this is all where you know, we can add and remove the SSL so we can see what's happening. So suddenly, literally everybody cared. And uh, well, I, I guess I don't have to explain it further in its audience. Um, but everybody now wanted the data centers uh, protected, the cloud instances, their, uh, uh, the MPLS was suddenly, everybody always assumed MPLS. Well, it's just for my vendor, you know, I, it's secure, it's private, it's not shared with anyone else. And suddenly everybody's like, shit, we need to encrypt this as well. We can't trust anyone. So it's really good for us. And, um, and for us, we came to the realization that actually, Opportunistic encryption is the same as cloud encryption. You just want an easy way for all members in your cloud to continuously mesh to everybody. And in a way, it's the same thing as internet-wide encryption, except where you pull the authentication keys from, whether it's from secure DNS of your internal zone in your cloud or a public DNS on, uh, on the internet. It's, it's sort of the same thing. So that's good, because now 
we can sort of look and, and, you know, I presented this to Red Hat and said, this is what we need for the enterprise encryption. And meanwhile, for free, I will get internet-wide encryption. So um, some of the ITF responses, um, they first defined that pervasive monitoring is an attack. So any plain text is basically considered a weakness and we must fix it. So that's a, it's a good point from, from the ITF. And second, they tried to define opportunistic security. It started with defining opportunistic encryption, which is really hard because the, the original uh, popularity of the term came from the Freestorm project. And what they meant with opportunistic encryption was two parties with no prearrangement when we find out they have a, the other side has a key, we are going to encrypt to that key, and if it fails, we're going to hard fail. What people now mean with opportunistic encryption, and that's why they sort of renamed it opportunistic security, is that, okay, let's try authenticated encryption, and if that fails, let's try unauthenticated encryption, and if that fails, we'll do uh, plain text. And, and of course, if you have a good indicator that there should be mandatory authenticated encryption, you will not do the, down, the, the, the downwards attack. Um, so so the, the terms are a little bit uh, different. Um, but what we're still going with the original. If you can find someone's public key advertised in a secure way, we take that to mean you must use encryption because they publish their key, they don't want plain text, they want encryption. So um, we uh, first defined a null authentication for Ike so that we could do the SSL model of being anonymous connecting to a server because that means all our laptops and phones can use this without having to have a key or a publishing mechanism or anything. And the second part is how we deal with uh, the NAT. And I'll get back to that. Um, so first, the, the Linux IPsec implementation, basically how it works is you've got a security policy database and a security association database. So one is basically the states between the endpoints, like the gateways, the IPsec machines, and the other table is basically the policy table of source destination addresses that are allowed to go over it. And they're linked with what's called a REC ID, they link the two together, so when a packet comes in, it's matched to a policy, the policy links to a state, the state has an encryption over decryption key, and you process the packet and then you send it on. And for each policy for which you don't find a state, you basically generate an acquire to use a land to anyone who's listening to the, to the request for acquires and say, hey, I've got the packet that triggered this policy but I have no state, maybe you want to go do something about that. And then the Ike daemon can go do Ike to the remote peer, set up a state, inject the key, and be ready. And meanwhile, um, you have to do something with the packet you are about to send out or receive. Like the packet you received, there's nothing you can do if you got it in, in the clear. But if you have a packet that you're sending out, then you can prevent it from being sent out. So um, that was actually a big problem because uh, up until the three something series of kernels, um, the packet would always be eaten. If it would generate an acquire, it would mean the packet is gone. Like it, it, it doesn't live anymore. So for things like ICMP or UDP, it doesn't really matter because the application will resend it. But for TCP, that was really a problem, especially if the TCP time was long, people are really seeing delays. Um, so I was hoping that this would get fixed and I actually only found out uh, about a month ago that it has actually been fixed in a three uh, series kernel now. So they actually cache the first TCP packet and once the tunnel comes up, they remember that they cached the packet and they send it out encrypted. So that, that was a, a big problem of, of the opportunistic or the on-demand tunnels in general that we couldn't do that and now we can. So that was a really good point. Um, So this is how it looks like. So the, the top half is the, um, the policy in the kernel. So you can see in this case, this is me on the Red Hat VPN. Um, they assigned me the address 10.3.230.191 uh, and its destination 10 slash 8. So that's the IP ranges that are covered. And for all of those packets that, that comply with those, uh, with those ranges, they will get encrypted by the key from the state that you see listed on. And so the IP addresses at the, at the bottom entries this is the remote and this is the local IP address. So these are the, the IPsec gateways and above it is the policies. Um, if you use the IP XFM command, you see a whole bunch of policies as well. Um, for instance, we do a thing like we poke a hole for the Ike port so you can never have a conflicting policy that says, oh, you should have encrypted your Ike packet with IPsec. So we, we poke holes in. So it looks quite ugly when you do IP XFRM poll but I, uh, I simplified it for this, uh, for this uh, slide. So what do we want to do for opportunistic? We want to make sure that 
every device that supports it can talk encrypted individually to the server. So there's no man in the middle or no gateways that, that collect traffic on behalf of others. Because um, even though the original uh, FreeSwan implementation allowed you to specify a gateway, you could say like the entire slash 24 has to go to that IP address. But since that was defined in the reverse DNS tree, they sort of were authoritative for that IP range. Since that didn't work and we have nothing else, so I cannot ask anybody who is authoritative for 1.2.3.0 slash 24. So, so we abandoned the whole concept of gateway. So it can only be host to host for us. Uh, but if you're a laptop or a phone, you can go through NAT or not, or you can connect to those servers if they support it. If they don't support it, you'll just get like a, an unencrypted link, which I marked here as, as red. Um, but you could, of course, also run it. Like, let's say you have a little router at home and all your devices, you know, your whatever, your smart TV doesn't support this for a while. You can have your little device do all the opportunistic encryption. It will just take all your connections. And since it's, it's triggering with the same mechanism, the, the NATing it does for the internal NAT is separate from the IPsec encryption it does for upstream. So it will just work as well. So the problem is when you're behind NAT, you have an IP address. Let's say, in this case, uh, what did I pick? 192.168.2.45. There could be many people with that same IP address. So if you inject that policy into your kernel, you're going to get conflicts. If you talk to different people with OE and you, uh, and you have the same pre-NAT IP address, then how is that server going to distinguish between the two sides? Um, so one solution would be, well, let the server assign an address to the client. So now you've moved the problem, right? Because now the server has no conflicts. It can take a thousand clients and hand out a thousand IP addresses and it's happy. But now the client connecting to two different opportunistic encryption servers can get assigned the same client and then it gets confused about what one wants to do. Plus, if you do this, you really don't want your laptop to have 10,000 IP addresses for every stream it talks to any remote machine on the net. So we want to have a method where we don't have to configure the IP address locally and we don't have conflicts. So what we've done is we added another IPsec policy rule. You see it in blue at the bottom. So you see the first three is the regular set of the, um, of the client address obtained. So the 164.0.2 was given by the remote server to the client. It installed that policy in the remote service, the 131. So it installed the standard uh, three rule policy, but then it also installed an IPsec policy from its pre-NAT IP address. And the only thing we do there is we're going to catch it. We're going to catch the packet. We cannot actually encrypt using that source address because the remote end would actually drop the packet because it wouldn't match the policy. But we'll use it to just grab the, grab the packet. And then in IP tables, we're adding a rule that says, oh, by the way, NAT this thing to whatever the IP address is that you know, they gave us. So now we basically, uh, we don't have to configure the IP address. It only sort of lives in the IPsec subsystem. So the server assigned us an address and it only lives inside the IPsec system. It, it doesn't get exposed to the, the machine itself. You don't have to configure it. You don't, you don't collect IP addresses. Now, the only problem with this is that it sort of interferes with other rules that people might put in the IP table. So because it really only applies to IPsec, I'm hoping that we can push this actually into the IPsec subsystem so that we can uh, do an XFRM call to the kernel saying, I want it to be IPsec natted with, to this third address, and then that the kernel will do it all by itself without having an IP tables entry. Any kernel hackers that have nothing to do, please approach me. <laughs> So how do you configure this? Um, so again, we're trying to make it as simple as possible, and so really my slide should just be way too simple for everybody. Um, we're looking still at making it simpler. This is still not as simple as we would like, and we've had some feedback from people that said that they find it confusing. But currently we have five different, what we call food groups. Block, clear, clear, or private, private, and private or clear. Block basically means drop all the, if you got a packet with this destination, ignore it, drop it. Um, it sort of overlaps with a firewall, so people don't have to use this. Um, it's just that originally when these things came along, you know, firewall rules were still, you know, IPFW admin. It was still, like, prehistoric. Um, clear means just ignore this package, just send it out. We will never do Ike on it, so just send it out. Private means we mandate that it's encrypted. So if it's not encrypted, drop the packet. If we don't have a state for it, tell the Ike daemon to do IPsec, try to set up a tunnel. And if the tunnel fails, just keep dropping the packets. 
private or clear means try and initiate, and if it for some reason fails, you'll just allow the packet to go out plain text. And clear or private is more meant for servers. Instead of having uh, to try all the clients that connect to it and all the clients don't support it, it will just go into a respond-only mode. So it will accept clear, but if someone comes in with an Ike packet, it will go and do an, uh, agree to do encryption. So here's an example. You've just put ciders in the, in the file. So in this case, uh, I have two slash 24, so I put them in private or clear because I know I have machines in that network that can do it. Um, of course, ideally, in a, once this you know, gets deployed widely, you can put zero slash zero in there. Um, and you can also combine this with like an enterprise encryption. So you can say, uh, in private, I will put 10 slash eight because that's my local enterprise and they all do, they all do encryption and I want it to be mandatory. That is that, so. The question is, how do how does authentication come in? And I'll show you a few more bits and tweaks that that is a problem, and that's why also we're looking at redoing this. Um, so this is this was the original design which we sort of revived and put in, but you know we now know that because we do want to say like you know try try to do authenticated and if not do anonymous, and so we need to have a better way of specifying that. Again, we have an OE mailing list. You can join us, oe uh, at uh, list.libreswan.org, and we welcome your input. <laughs> because this is a hard problem. Like, to keep things simple is really difficult. So how does this work internally? Um, internally, for, for Libreswan, this is just an IPsec connection. It, it's not really different from, from anything else. So um, left equals default route basically means grab whatever the IP address is that is your default route and use that as your source address. Left ID is from cert, as if you have a certificate, just use the ID from the certificate, just read it in. Um, oh, so, so this is the example for an enterprise encryption cloud. So, so imagine you have a 10 slash eight cloud deployment, you have, you have Puppet, you've given all your hosts a certificate, right? Um, so then left cert is your certificate, uh, right is opportunistic, meaning anyone can connect and it will trigger this, this special uh, private connection. Again, the remote has its ID from the cert. Uh, you just say write CA same, so the CA that's authorized your certificate is also valid for the, for the peer certificate. IQv2 is insist because we ripped everything out of the IQv1 code that had to do with opportunistic encryption. We didn't want to deal with any kind of, so we've, we, it only works when you force the connection to IQv2. And then here's two of your tweaks. Failure shunt and negotiation shunt. Failure shunt is what to do after you fail to uh, bring up an I connection when you failed. You can say drop, clear, uh, and then there's one negotiation shunt. So some people actually find it more important that the communication keeps running unencrypted, but they would like it to be encrypted if possible, but they don't want you to drop the connection. So they don't even want a pause while the Ike negotiation is happening that they don't have a packet flow. So this allows you to say, negotiation shunt either hold, as in drop the, hold onto the packets, or really drop them, it's not holding them. Drop the packets until the Ike is done and then do whatever the outcome is. Or you can say negotiation shunt is clear, in which case you will leak packets during the Ike negotiation. And we sort of, we like having these options, but we're still a little confused about, we don't really want to bother the users with this because they're going to make the wrong choices, they're going to copy old configs from Google searches, and, and so we, we, we're looking at how to, how to make this more obvious to people still. But it, it works really well. Um, so this is uh, fully anonymous IPsec. Uh, so this is like no authentication on either side. Um, so you see the only changes really are left ID is null, right ID is null, and auth by is null. Um, and clearly you, you make sure that you do a pass through because if you don't get anonymous, you will just leak clear text. And then we did one as an example to use Let's Encrypt. So like everybody has a CA that they sort of trust. Let's Encrypt is pretty famous. Uh, they see pretty wide deployment. So we're like, you know what? We can use this CA to do our you know, anonymous client to authenticated server. So we just like feed onto, the, onto their system. So this is how you um, grab the certificates from Let's Encrypt site. Unfortunately, there's one, um, so the Identity Trust X3 one for some reason, they publish them without the begin certificate and end certificate lines on their website. So I just copied it and put those lines in front of it and put it on my website. So it does make it easier to install it. 
Um, there's some commands to read these certificates, import them into the NSS database. Libreswine uses its own NSS database that is like only for IPsec. It doesn't, so it doesn't have all the root CAs from all the TLS servers all over the world. It's just for IPsec. So when you put this in, you're ready to be an anonymous client to a remote server. So this is the demo that I will actually try and show you. Um, but in case it fails, I'll explain it. Um, so uh, the config I just showed you, you can download from that site. You can put the single IP address in the private or clear so that the mechanism will trigger. And then you just ping, and you'll see here that the first packet was eaten. The first packet didn't make it, and the second and third packet did. And then when you do IPsec WAC traffic status, it will show you. And so we got the address 0.2 assigned. But again, that address only lives inside the IPsec subsystem, so you don't have to worry about it. Um, and it just works. Um, so this is that client config for asymmetrical. So you can see left, left ID is null, left auth is null. Left mode CFG uh, just means that you will allow an IP address to be assigned. Left cat is yes, that is our, you know, our, our crypto NAT uh, solution. So we say yes, you can do this hack with the IP table rules and the extra policy. And then the other side is just a regular you know, ID from CERT, I expect them to authenticate by CERT and expect that I know the CA in my NSS database. Narrowing is yes, it's just a feature of uh, how Ike v2 works with an address assignment. The client basically says, hey, I'm okay with zero slash zero, and I'll allow you to narrow it down, and then the, the remote server can narrow it down to one address and say, okay, but we're gonna make a tunnel for only this one address. Um, this is the server side. So at the server side, what you do, you first install Let's Encrypt normally. So um, what this is, um, I forgot what the tool was called, CertCom or ComCert, like they're the, the Let's Encrypt uh, tool to, to set up for Let's Encrypt. So if you, if you install that and run it, then you, you have the Let's Encrypt command, you give it your host name, and it will put all of your certificates in ETC Let's Encrypt live and then your DNS name. And so we just take those certificates we uh, put it into a PKSS12 file and then we import it into the NSS uh, system for Libreswan. So now the IPsec system knows about it. You do the server configuration and you put the, the entire world into clear or private so you'll just respond to everybody who wants to do Ike to you and then you, uh, you run it. And this is how it looks like. Um, so you can see here, I defined the address pool to be 100.6401. For those who might recognize the address, I stole it from the carrier grade network people. Since they decided to cause all the problems with NAT, I decided to take their addresses. They're never supposed to be visible outside of carrier grade networks, so I'm never supposed to see them anyway. Uh, and it avoids conflicts, because if I, would, if I would put RFC 1918 addresses here, and your pre-NATed IP address is also in that range, you get weird conflicts. So this is my way of staying out of RFC 1918 with addresses of people who caused the problems. Um, and then our features uh, that we're planning. So we're planning to add like Kerberos, GSS API. Um, we're going to do the DNS triggers. Um, one of the features I actually didn't talk about, um, one, the, the old clip stack had this really nice feature. You had an IPsec zero interface and people could TCP dump on it and see all the clear text, all the post and post decrypted and pre-encrypted traffic. Um, and then when they sniffed the Ether device, they could just see the encrypted traffic. Um, and you couldn't do that with, uh, with XFRM until recently when the VTI support actually, uh, actually came in. And now you can use the IP tunnel command to actually add a VTI type device and you can sort of recreate the IPsec zero device. And these two features, this and the, the uh, opportunistic encryption uh, packet caching for the TCP packet were the two things that were missing for us to finally kill the clip stack. And it's been since, what was it, 1996? Uh, yeah. <laughs> Right, so we can finally kill that kernel module. Um, if you want to see the pain of my life, <laughs> let's see if I can, uh, I was afraid of that, okay. Uh, where did my browser go? That's a new browser.
huh, I cannot even unfull screen my browser to move it to the other window. <laughs> okay, so but there's a file called uh, in the LibreSound tree, uh, Linux net include IPsec K version dot H. That is basically a giant if dev from kernel versions. From, we, we stripped everything from, from 2.4 before, but it used to contain everything from 2.4 up until the 3 kernel. Every time you guys changed the API, we had to put a macro in place to support the older and the newer kernel. <laughs> and so it's, it's a giant uh, if dev file with, uh, where I learned a lot more about the kernel than I really wanted to know. Uh, So let's see if I can move these for a little demo. Um. Uh, the other really bad thing before VTI was that uh, if you run TCP dump on an IPsec tunnel that you had set up, you would, outgoing uh, packets, you wouldn't see the encrypted version. You would see the plain text version because TCP dump grabbed the packet before it got encrypted. And so after TCP dump saw it and displayed it to you, it would get encrypted, but you would never see it. But for the incoming packet, you would see the encrypted packet and you would see the decrypted packet. That confused so many people that they were like, oh, my tunnel is working half, but half of it is plain text. Like, no, I'm sorry, you just, Run TCP dump on another machine in, the, in the, between them and you'll see it work. So you'll see here that I've logged into a different machine to avoid that problem. Um, so that's let's encrypt.libreson.org. Um, so we'll run, I guess maybe people already started doing things. Oh, that's SSH. Okay, hold on. I guess it's showing too much. So I'm not running IPsec on my laptop yet. So let's ping. Let's encrypt. So we see ping packets going there. Okay, baseline test. We also predate all the init systems, so we have an IPsec command that does all of that and maps to sysv, systemd, upstart, so I never have to worry about like what init system wins today. Um, and um, so that's the file I showed you that is loaded. So now let's ping again. All oh, right, I'll clear the screen here. And it's getting encrypted. And so this should scale easily, right? You can put this on, on all of your servers. Your client will just do it. If you prefer not to have packet loss and leak a bit in the clear at the beginning of your connection, you can do so. If you want to hold your packets and you know, you're willing to wait one second or so before failure or clear text hits, then you can do that too. So that's it. Um, questions? Comments? Do you have time? Sorry? We're running over time. Okay, we're running out of time. Okay, so catch me in the hallways on the ground if you want. So thanks. <laughs>